Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ben Hammersley. I'm the editor at large of Wired magazine. I'm going to be chairing this, and so I'm going to be shutting up very, very quickly and handing over to my guests. But this is obviously the television festival dedicated to the internet with Eric Schmidt talking last night. And so many sessions, more digital sessions this year than, than really ever before. Joining me and giving the Future View speech is Glenn Brown, who's the director of business development at Twitter. Twitter, since its launch in 2006, has grown to more than 200 million users worldwide. 70% of those are outside of the US. It's huge. It's a massive phenomenon. I should imagine pretty much everybody in this room is on Twitter at some time during the day. If you're on Twitter right now in this session, you can join the back channel and send me questions. The hashtag is not on the screen anymore, but it is the name of the room, um, Fintry, F-I-N-T-R-Y. I can see them coming up on the screen in front of me. We're going to have a talk, then we're going to have a chat, and then we're going to open it to questions from you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Brown. Thanks very much. Um, very happy here today to uh, give the Future View lecture. Um, there's been uh, a lot of talk at this conference and in general in, in, um, in recent times about uh, a futuristic and kind of amorphous sounding thing, social TV, which is what I'm going to talk about today. But I'm going to talk about it uh, in a way that I hope uh, demystifies it some. Um, one, using uh, an old kind of metaphor. Um, and two, giving some really specific examples of what Twitter has learned from social TV. Um, so I will be talking a lot about Twitter, but I think that uh, I will be applying them to some general principles that I think would be useful for uh, thinking about social TV in a new way. And finally, I want to um, invite you all to join me at the end in, in some kind of uh, creative, speculative thinking about where social TV can go uh, from here. Um, you saw the title of the talk is called Hosting Social TV. And I actually don't mean this kind of host, this kind of talk show host. This is Craig Ferguson, who got his big break at the Fringe Festival, actually, a few years back. Um, that kind of talk show is very familiar, but I want to think about the host in, in a more original uh, sense of the term, uh, the host of a social gathering uh, or any sort of party, um, the host of a kind of well-organized uh, high culture event that, with uh, a, a large uh, audience. This is a, a painting um, that depicts the uh, Paris Salon of 1824, and it's hosted by, basically, the Paris Salon was the biggest uh, art show of its time, exhibiting the works of living French artists. People would come from all over France to come see it. The king would welcome them. This is Charles X, uh, handing out awards for the artists who are exhibiting there. And interestingly, um, it was in the Louvre, uh, right off the Champs-Élysées, and the, the, the event was priced such that ordinary uh, French citizens could afford it. Uh, and it was actually free on Sundays as well. So you'd have thousands of people coming through this particular show. I note all those details because we'll, we'll come back to them. And finally, uh, another kind of host. Um, the host who, and we all know somebody like this, we're not, not necessarily Andy Warhol here, but we all have a friend or an acquaintance who is the kind of host who raises the, the act of hosting to its kind of own art form, uh, an art form in and of itself. Um, so I want to apply this idea of hosting to social TV and thinking about social TV as really a social gathering. Um, what do we mean by social TV at a really high level? It's basically just what happens around a show outside the four corners of the screen. Um, it is, what's the sensation in the audience? Um, what, is the audience what are the audience members saying to each other? Uh, in the digital age, it's what are audience members saying to potentially cast members or creatives who are involved in it? What are the different cast members or creatives saying to each other around it? Basically, everything that happens outside the four corners of the broadcast. Um, and I want to suggest that basically the simplest way to, to approach uh, social TV is as a social gathering. Um, on one end of the spectrum, just a simple party that could be spontaneous. It could be self-organized. In this, in this painting here, the boat party by uh, Renoir, there's actually no host pictured. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, something very formal, um, uh, organized, centralized, but at the same time, uh, wildly democratic. Um, and finally, uh, again, the, the social gathering that in and of itself is an art form that is uh, blurring the lines between uh, experience and story um, that kind of blurs the lines between the observed and the observer, between the show and the audience. Um, so I want to think about those three models for uh, how we think about um, social TV. So one point that I'm going to make here is that um, in terms of the, the party without a host, the spontaneous party, is that social TV is 
already happening, has been happening for a long time, actually precedes the internet, um, and that, there's, that it's inevitable. Um, the second kind of social TV that we'll, that we'll talk about is uh, organized social TV, or social TV by invitation, um, which is happening more and more these days. And finally, I want to think a little bit about uh, where social t uh, TV can go in and of itself as an art form. Um, in addition to what's playing on the screen, uh, outside the four corners of the screen, uh, in terms of the whole experience of social TV, uh, where, it's, where it's going. Um, but first, the spontaneous uh, social TV. And I said that I think social TV is inevitable, that it's already happening, that it has been happening for a while. And I want to explain a little bit about that. Um, so why is it that I say that social TV is inevitable uh, and precedes the internet, precedes um, the digital age? It basically comes down to uh, a, 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 um, instinct, a human instinct that we want to see what other people are seeing, one. And two, when we experience a, such an amazing spectacle, such a wondrous sight that we can't believe our eyes, maybe it's an, a dancing elephant, maybe it's the striker for your favorite team kicking a bicycle kick, um, in, the, in the final minutes of the game. Um, maybe it's a plot twist in a soap opera that you've been watching all year that completely blows your mind. Your first instinct when you see a spectacle that you can't quite believe your eyes about is you want to turn to a friend and say, did you see that? You want to confirm that you actually can believe what you saw, right? That's the actual origin of any kind of social entertainment experience. Um, and you know, we're familiar with this, this image of, of kind of this form of social TV of the family gathered around the living room. Um, in the early days of television. It's really the same thing today, it's just that all these living rooms obviously are interconnected uh, with digital technology. Uh, all the pubs with TVs in them are connected through digital technology with, with our mobile phones, et cetera. Here's a uh, familiar concept. Um, not too long ago, everyone's talking about it. This was the tagline for, for EastEnders. Basically the same idea, social TV. Here's an example that's, that's fun that I found in, in doing some research on the royal wedding and what Twitter did around that. Um, I found this is the official invitation uh, to the royal wedding that went out. There was also an invitation or an announcement anyway sent out on Twitter, which is fun. Um, and while, when I found this, I actually found this kind of knockoff invitation that some ordinary folks made for a barbecue uh, celebrating the royal wedding. And they listed as the location, if you put here, you see on the official invitation, the location is at Westminster Abbey. On this, on this invitation, the location is on TV. So this is quite, quite a literal case of social TV. Um, so in terms of the, the spontaneous or inevitable um, social TV party, um, social TV gathering, basically you have all the elements in place already, all the raw materials for a social gathering. Um, you've got the devices and the means of participation. You've got the majority of young people uh, using second screens while they're watching television. So there's a way to connect there. You've got the venue uh, or venues, as it might be. There's a proliferation of sites online where you can uh, share what it is you're seeing with your friends. Um, so there, there's that element. And finally, this is the most, probably the most important part. There's the enthusiasm. So this is, uh, these are some charts that show our uh, kind of records, world records for tweets per second. Um, and the interesting thing to note about them is that four of these, all of them except the BET Awards here, the fourth one, didn't involve any sort of formal invitation to participate. Um, there, was no, there was no hashtag on screen. There was no um, you know, Twitter campaign around this by the, World's Cup, by the World Cup or the Copa or UEFA. And yet people gathered and rallied around this because it was a worldwide event. So this is the, the point that basically people will be talking about um, your story, your content, your show, your spectacle, if it inspires them to, to do so. And that's going to happen no matter what. And it's happening now online whether you, whether you plan it or not. To such an extent, in fact, that if the content's good enough and if you have a dedicated enough following for it, um, here's an example of a show called Arrested Development that was, had a cult following in the States for just two or three seasons and uh, probably has a cult following uh, in many, many more places now. Um, but this is a screenshot I took just last week from a search for Arrested Development. Um, there were 27 tweets about Arrested Development while I was taking the screenshot. The noteworthy thing here is the show hasn't been on the air in over five years, right? So, not, not, social TV is this inevitable. If you have good stuff, people will be talking about it. They will be gathering around it, and, uh, and, and you will see these kind of interactions, um, whether it's invited or not. Now, the catch to this is if you don't provide an actual formal invitation, if you don't provide a specific venue 
or a kind of a theme for people to talk uh, around as part of this kind of social gathering, then this uh, second screen experience can potentially be um, diffusing of people's attention um, and a missed opportunity more than anything else to actually have them engage more with what's happening on the first screen. Um, a way to reach out to their friends to talk about what it is they're seeing uh, or a way to actually connect with the show in a more engaged way. There's a potential for a little bit of distraction there. Um, and finally, if you don't specify a, a venue in a specific place, obviously there's a chance of diffusion of the message there. And the, the downside to that is that um, it's less of a shared experience. It's, it's, there's, a, there's, there's a mediation between the one kid seeing the, walking, uh, the dancing elephant and his friend. Um, they can't talk quite as directly, the, and the conversation is, is diffused a bit. So what happens if you actually take the, the basic, basic steps to, um, to organize social TV around the ideas of what are the basic elements of any social gathering? Really, really basic stuff. Um, a place, a theme, uh, and a time. Um, the interesting thing is that these Twitter tools, which we're all familiar with, I was thinking about them, they're essentially the, exactly serve this function. Um, a hashtag is both a place in that when you click on a hashtag, you're taken to a list of all the terms uh, or all the tweets out there that uh, contain the hashtag, and it's basically the venue for that conversation. Uh, and it's also a theme. You can actually call uh, people to action with what the message of the actual hashtag is. Account names are obviously a sort of address as well for going to follow exactly uh, where that is going on. And it just happens that this is, this is the actual slide that we send out, um, and you can find on media.twitter.com to TV producers in terms of what are the best practices. Um, they're pretty basic. Um, they make a huge difference. You, we see two to 10 times the engagement on Twitter, two to 10 times the engagement if some combination of these are present. So including a hashtag on air, um, actually giving somebody a theme or a question to respond to, to rally around. Um, having a way to connect to uh, the talent or the hosts um, via Twitter, and then actually live tweeting with the show. So here's a, here's a um, UK example, Dragon's Den. How many of you all watch Dragon's Den? I'm just curious. OK, great. So when you click on Dragon's Den and the hashtag they use, um, you see the conversation aggregated in one place. This, is, this provides a sense of place. This is kind of a fun thing I noticed when I was taking this screenshot. So Dragon's Den has me bewildered. I've pressed the red button. I've heard a few. A few references to the red button, the sort of proto-social TV uh, during the conference. Um, here's a, another example uh, that's also been mentioned a few times uh, in the last couple days, uh, BBC Question Time, where they provide both the hashtag and an ad handle. And the, the important part about having the account name is that you then can get followers are essentially long-term subscribers. You can push out any kind of message to them over a long period of time. Um, Another example um, from nearby is the uh, One Year to Go event um, in London in Trafalgar Square. And I was talking before about hashtags as sort of a virtual gathering point. Um, sometimes they can actually make it into an actual physical venue. And the interesting thing about this is that this unites both the people in the actual event physically and the people who can see it on the broadcast. So when you, uh, when you look at what people are tweeting about, they're, they're, they're uniting around a theme um, regardless of where they are, if they're in a living room at home watching it, or if they're actually in the square and uploading, say, pictures. I'll show you an example of that. Here's an example from the States. Uh, home Run Derby is a, a, a tradition that before the baseball all-star game, um, a bunch of players get together, and it's kind of a lighthearted competition, and they just basically hit as many balls over the fence as they can in front of the crowd. It's kind of just a raw, very typically American, raw display of just um, hitting things really hard. Um, <laughs> Um, and the interesting thing is that they put this hashtag HR Derby um, in the actual venue and so that when you're watching at home and they put it in just the right camera angles, you're watching at home and you see this hashtag there, it doesn't have to show up on the air. It shows up on, it doesn't have to be put on the air in terms of like a Chiron or overlay or something like that. It's actually just going to be there. And at the same time, all the players, um, all the fans, all the people at home know what to tag their photos with. So these are real-time search results during the Home Run Derby for photos marked with uh, HR Derby. Now just imagine, especially in the year, next year or so, different uses of this kind of tool where you're crowdsourcing essentially a bunch of uh, photographed content. Imagine what this is going to look like in the middle of the Olympics, uh, both down on the field, down on the stadium, 
Imagine what it looks like uh, distributed. Imagine if you had a theme that was um, that, that encouraged people in Jamaica to take a picture of the expression on their faces during the 100 meter dash, right? Um, imagine if you had a theme around uh, the various big elections that are coming up in 2012 um, to, to encourage people to express um, who they're voting for or, or why they care about um, what's going on. Um, I mentioned theme as well. This is a really great example of theme in a hashtag, uh, sort of a rallying point for a, a social gathering. Um, this is a show called 106 in Park. There was a clip in the, in the first bit on video about this. Um, they're really great about uh, setting a new theme every day. So every day of their show, uh, they set out a new hashtag, and they actually build user responses to that hashtag around that theme into the on-air segment. So they're pulling tweets off of uh, Twitter um, based around this hashtag or theme and using it, using it on air. They sometimes even ask users to submit a particular um, uh, a theme for the day. Um, and so this is interesting because this show is on daily, and they can make a, a trend happen worldwide on Twitter. And they regularly do, um, because it, it starts trending so fast that it takes off. And that creates a virtuous cycle, right, on the theory that we want to see what other people are seeing. When you go on Twitter and you make something trend, more people are going to click on it. It's going to trend further. Uh, and it carries on and on. So I've talked about place, an easy way to provide place and provide an organizing principle there. Um, I've talked about a theme or activity, a kind of a structure there to get, get people's conversation around a particular point so it doesn't get too diffused. But, um, but what about time? Um, the fun thing is, I think the most, probably the most distinguishing feature about Twitter specifically um, is the time element of it, that Twitter really just kind of reflects whatever's happening that's been scheduled elsewhere. Um, so if your show has a regular schedule and your uh, audience is accustomed to showing up religiously uh, at 8 o'clock on Tuesday night, um, they will express themselves religiously at 8 o'clock on Tuesday night. Um, you see here a chart showing engagement on Twitter around the show, Pretty Little Liars, which is uh, it's kind of like the um, uh, American equivalent of EastEnders, but for uh, teenagers, kind of. Um, and you see that right as the show is starting, there's a, there's a huge spike. Throughout the dramatic arcs of the show, people are engaging more and less. Um, as soon as the show's over, you have a drop-off, but it doesn't totally die out, and you have some kind of echo effects that still go on. Um, and it doesn't always have to be something that's scheduled for Twitter to reflect it in real time. Um, just last week, um, we actually had an earthquake on the east coast of the US. I'm sure you heard, because um, we were fussing about it, but no one, no one got hurt, fortunately. Um, but we had a very strange experience in the Twitter New York office, um, where we were reading about the earthquake and its epicenter in, right next to Washington, DC, on Twitter before we felt the tremor in the office. Um, so pretty, pretty strange. And it actually just, I didn't make this up, totally coincidentally, the, the, our creative team that puts, puts these um, stats together calls this the, the creative seismograph. Um, that's, so that was actually, that's the, their, their term for it. This, this principle works over time as well with periodic events. So this is what the same show looks like week over week. You see it doesn't ever totally die off between episodes. Um, there's still some life there, but then it, everyone's there at the same time. So what's one of the implications of this is that Twitter and the real-time aspect of it is bringing back the shared experience of wanting to see something as it's happening the first time, not to PVR it or DVR it or record it and watch it later, but to be able to watch it with other people as it's happening. Um, so this, I mean, this demonstrates that exactly, right, that people are showing up and, and talking about it at, at exactly the same time. And that's a huge, interesting, um, interesting kind of turn back to the past with a twist that live TV is really engaging again. It's in a, in a world where everything is reprodu infinitely reproducible and replayable, this is, the hot new thing is that it's live and you're watching it. So it's kind of a, a fun return to the past that way. Um, here's another way you can kind of play with time on Twitter. And I mentioned this before in the, uh, the best practices, which is to, to, to live tweet on screen. Um, again, I mentioned that we've seen some of those best practices, the hashtags, the using your account name on air, um, tweeting during the show will increase engagement on Twitter two to 10 times. Um, this is an example from Survivor. You saw another clip that was mentioned in the, the video at the beginning. 
um, where in one episode in the fall, um, there was no live tweeting done by the host in the, in the spring season. Uh, there was, and you saw a big jump in engagement, particularly around the finale. Um, in this particular example, the host wasn't actually on air tweeting. This was, it was that, that the host, during the broadcast, the pre-recorded broadcast, would tweet about what was happening, almost like a DVD director's commentary. Um, and you get really good engagement that way. So another example, uh, a show called No Reservations, Anthony Bourdain, who would actually put tweets on air um, during the show in sort of this bottom part of the screen. Um, and like the show, the, the content is, you know, in, 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 uh, in character for his, for his kind of persona. He's kind of like a curmudgeonly, uh, hard-living persona. And, uh, and the, the tweets that he put out during the show reflect that. Um, another thing you can do with time is actually schedule stuff. You don't have to, like I said, uh, but you can actually schedule times on Twitter. And what a lot of people will do is uh, do a Q&A or a kind of guest appearance on Twitter at a specific time to kind of gather interest around it in no relation to the show. So here's a show, uh, here's an actress from a show called True Blood on HBO, which, uh, which yesterday Ricky Gervais called the best, the best network in the world. I tend to agree. Um, they're, they're really uh, innovative, HBO, obviously on the content and storytelling side, but they're also going, they're taking big, huge steps on the social side. They have these couple of new tools called HBO Go and HBO Connect that help people aggregate conversations around all their shows. They're putting hashtags before, even narrative shows. It's not all just like talk shows and game shows and competitions and things. There'll be shows like uh, Game of Thrones, which is kind of a fantasy show, that right before it goes on, there's a, just a little hashtag, Game of Thrones. So it's very subtle. It doesn't inter interfere with the programming at all. But here's an example from, from True Blood, where one of the actresses from the, from the show is tweeting live from Comic-Con, which is a comic book convention in, in San Diego. No real direct relation to the show, not during the show, no relation to the time of the broadcast of the show. Uh, but there's a pretty similar demographic, probably, between the people who go to the comic book convention and the people who watch the show about sexy vampires. Um, and this is what it looks like in terms of her engagement with the users. So we've got this, got this follower, Ginger McQueen, wherever she might be, and she suggests uh, something for Janina to do at Comic-Con, grab you know, someone out of the crowd and, and turn them into a vampire, essentially, through makeup, et cetera. And this is kind of fun, too, that this particular tweet and the response has been retweeted by um, Anna Paquin, who's another cast member of the show, right? So this message now fans out to whoever's following Ginger McQueen and all her friends. They see, oh my God, she's just gotten an answer back from the actress in the show that we love so much. Uh, but also to all of Janina's fans, who see this, oh, she's, she's cool, she's reaching out and talking to fans, and to all of uh, Anna Paquin's fans. Um, so, again, the, the best practices that we use for these, for these sorts of, uh, and that we advise for these sorts of things. Um, the side effect of these, apart from establishing kind of time and place and theme, that's really interesting is the feedback loop it creates. Um, so giving an audience structure in terms of where to show up to have that social experience off the TV, uh, as the benefit of you know, giving them some structure to really engage. But it has the side effect of this, of being able to measure um, how, it is that they're, uh, how it is that they're feeling at any given moment. Um, this is one of the, the most interesting things about, I think, what's to come. We're at the kind of tip of the iceberg of being able to um, sense what the audience is feeling at any given moment about a show. I mean, up until now, it's not totally insane to say that the experience from a broadcaster's point of view was a little bit like being an actor on stage and not being able to see if people were hearing what you were saying. It was kind of a two-week delay. You broadcast something, you can't see the audience's faces. Um, you can get some Nielsen numbers, but there's going to be a delay. They're not going to be complete. I think we're going to start seeing a much more kind of a mirroring of what it's like to be on a stage in front of a live audience and that sort of feedback loop. We see, uh, you know, comics will sometimes tweet jokes to kind of work out their material. We see um, some shows actually changing uh, where the kind of climax happens in the 30-minute episode or the, the hour-long episode because they want to have some, a lot of the excitement up front to be able to generate a buzz throughout the rest of the episode. Um, so we're seeing a really interesting uh, feedback loop there. And actually, I, since I love them, I'll, I'll quote them again. Uh, yesterday, Ricky Gervais said that, uh, you know, when you're doing stand-up, um, the audience writes your bits, right? So there's that sort of extreme of kind of feedback loop. Um, and I think, you know, TV from the kind of uh, blind broadcast experience is moving closer and closer to that. Um, 
So here you see a sentiment analysis from, from the show Game of Thrones that I was talking about before. There are uh, an increasing number as well of third parties, startups, uh, companies um, on both sides of the Atlantic that are uh, providing these kind of metrics and analytics that are looking at social networks and creating these charts, sort of a Nielsen's um, for social networks and popularity. Um, this basically aggregates across a bunch of different social networks what people are talking about, what the sentiment is, um, this new kind, of, new kind of top charts. And here's a, here's a slide from a company called Bluefin that's in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. They're really a bunch of MIT folks. They're really technically savvy. And they're, this is fun. It's a little bit confusing because there's so much going on, but I think it captures uh, the idea of just how this, if this is happening now. This is basically a heat map of activity, of engagement across every network in the US across a span of a week. Um, and it dynamically changes uh, to show which, what people are registering with. And it's sort of like this, uh, it reminded me of this Andy Warhol quote. Um, it's basically like being able to see out there all at once um, on a screen, what are all the social gatherings happening around TV? And how intense are they? And where are they shifting? What are the patterns? Um, so it's, and this is all happening now, right? So imagine where are we going to be in just a few years. Um, I want to use that, that idea to, to transition into the last kind of piece of, of uh, last kind of approach to social media um, or social TV. And the metrics piece and the feedback piece really contributes to this a lot. I think because TV is becoming more interactive, because as a broadcaster or performer, you can perceive how the audience is reacting, it's going to enable more and more the idea of the social TV experience as a work of art in and of itself, or as an art form in and of itself, in the kind of Warholian sense of blurring the lines between story and experience, um, blurring the lines between who exactly is the performer and who exactly is the observer. Um, so I want to just end by thinking again about how we transition from this kind of concept of, of the host to uh, possibly um, the, the unhosted social TV experience, which I think is inevitable. Um, and some sort of uh, organized social TV experience with a kind of centralized host, but radically democratic and widespread in participation. Um, imagine what uh, the sort of today's equivalent of the social TV experience of the Paris Salon might be. Um, that combination of the highest of high culture and totally widespread access and interaction. What, if the, what, if the, what would it look like if the, something like the Paris Salon today had uh, live internet feeds coming out of it in terms of live video streams, or if everybody there had a phone uh, that they were uh, using to sort of engage with the whole thing. Um, what would that look like exactly? Um, similarly, what, it's a fun exercise to think, what would, what would Andy Warhol do with social media? Um, that's worth spending a good, a good few months just thinking about. Um, what would he do, what would he have done with Twitter? And um, what version of social TV would kind of emulate around the television broadcast and all of that happens outside of those four corners, that sort of experience where the art is as much about the show as it is about the experience of witnessing the show and participating in it and the give and take. So if you think about kind of, um, to come back to the idea of a party, like think about as you leave today, um, the best party you ever went to or the most memorable social gathering that you ever attended or were part of or hosted or even just kind of dreamed of hosting, like someday when you have your big birthday bash or you want someone to throw you a surprise party that's not really a surprise party. What would it look like? What, would, what, what were the key elements of that favorite party of yours, if you can remember your favorite party? I think I can't remember most of my favorite parties. Um, but uh, was, it that, was it the venue itself that made the, the occasion? Was it the, the mix of guests was it that the host was particularly expert in something and served as sort of a guide in experiencing what the gathering was about? Uh, was it some kind of detail um, about the party that was so well thought out that it, it really stuck with you forever? Was it something you could take with you, like a gift from someone there uh, or someone you met there? Um, and then think about how, when you have that kind of picture in your head, whether it's a memory or whether it's a dream, think about how you would, might apply that to social TV. The technical part, as I think I've shown you of all this, is actually not that hard. It's really simple. 
You just have to follow kind of a few basic rules, give people a time, a place, and a theme. Then if you want to go really big, think about um, the original point about it's always going to be initially driven by this instinct to want to see what other people see and to want to uh, confirm that we can actually believe our eyes about what's happening is always going to drive the whole thing. Um, and that the fun thing about, about social TV today, even though it's been around for a really long time in its own way, the fact that it's around, to the, 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 the form that it's in today makes it the most exciting time to think about exactly this kind of social experience. Because even if an uh, audience member is totally alone, they can use uh, the internet or digital technologies, their phone, they're always going to have a friend at the party with them, right? Um, they're always going to be able to exercise that instinct to want to uh, confirm that what they just saw and couldn't believe their eyes uh, actually happened. And they can always ask, did you see that? Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over now back to Ben and I'm going to ask a few, uh, answer a few questions and uh, um, hopefully have a little dialogue. So thanks. Thanks, Glenn. That was um, incredibly inspiring, both for myself and also for the people in the back channel on Twitter who will continue to send me questions undoubtedly. The first thing that I really have to ask you on behalf of, of some of the more grumpy people in the room is um, why should we bother? Does it make viewer figures go up? Do we make any more money from this? Or is it not just a, you know, is it not just a, a fashionable thing to do that's just going to cost us cash? Um, well, so I think that the initial point stands that this is going to be happening anyway. And I think that people are going to be talking about your shows. Um, people already are. And that I don't think it, it doesn't actually require that much, uh, that large of an expenditure of energy or money um, because the tools are so simple to actually just kind of reach out and suggest. I'm not saying it's like a, a magic bullet for everything. I'm saying it's enhancing the experience. Um, and has the potential to really enhance the experience. Um, I think we have some um, kind of correlative evidence that it increases viewing as well as engagement on Twitter. Um, we just recently had a promotion around Shark Week uh, in the States, which is a week of uh, sharks eating things, on, <laughs> clips of sharks eating things over and over. Um, it's really entertaining, actually. Um, but, uh, and uh, we noticed that in that promotion of that week, um, there was an interesting coincidence in terms of the demographics of the, uh, the viewers that the broadcaster told us about later, that it was disproportionately female and young audience, um, and that they noticed on their Twitter uh, accounts that their Twitter users were also disproportionately female and young, um, unusually so. And so it doesn't prove causation, but there's definitely a correlation there. And I think at the, at the very least, um, you have to think that uh, this is what, especially younger people, I think, are used to uh, doing while they're, while they're watching TV, and it, it helps structure the experience. So. But to that point, is this, a, is this a demographically bound thing? Is this, is this something you're only going to see on certain types of shows uh, aimed primarily at young people? You know, it was mostly sort of MTV and, and things like that. Or are we, are we going to see this on you know, Antiques Roadshow, for example? Mm. I mean, I do think, I think about the viewership of a show like No Reservations. Um, foodies, uh, usually probably well-to-do, probably not that young. It's probably not that interesting to the MTV crowd. Um, think about news shows um, or politics shows like BBC Question Time. Pretty much any show on CNN um, will have um, a Twitter element to it. Uh, so, no, we've seen it across uh, game shows, sports, um, a, lot of, a lot more narrative shows. I think there's a kind of, um, everyone associates uh, The Voice or X Factor and, and shows like that, which use Twitter really, really well. Um, and they assume that that's kind of the only use of Twitter, but it also goes well with, with any, kind of, any kind of storytelling, so. Many of your, uh, your examples, the, the, the MTV one, the, the BET one as well, were, were, are shows which are shown in a very large market to a very large number of people. Mm -hmm. um, we're much, this is a much smaller country with, with much smaller audiences. Is there, a, is there a, um, you know, a critical mass that you require for it to actually take off and, and have the all 700, 800, 1,000 tweets a second? That's a good question. I mean, I think, yeah, to hit those sorts of numbers, 
Um, we, the, the kind of common themes we see to hit that kind of scale are uh, it's a live event. The audience is uh, multi-geography or global. Um, there's some element of competition or high stakes uh, to it. Um, they're undetermined outcomes. Um, so a lot of times, sports is perfect for that. Obviously, it hits all of those, uh, especially, especially football. Um, but it can also happen in, in narrative. Um, and, and interestingly, I don't think it necessarily takes a large, uh, a mass viewership like something like the World Cup to register. Think about, um, so I'm most familiar with these two examples from the States, ESPN, the sports network, um, uh, only its viewership is only um, some, something like 10% um, of cable viewers make up 90% of ESPN viewers. So it's a small, relatively market compared to big broadcasters, but it's a super engaged market and their permanent market rates are through the roof as a result, many multiples what other cable channels are. HBO is similar, not that many people have HBO and there's a fever around the people who do, sure. right? Sure. Uh, have you ever found that the, um, the rate of tweeting is predictive of future success of a slightly obscure show? You know, you have a show which doesn't have many um, viewers at the beginning, but the, the, the viewers that you have are very engaged, and that predicts you know, future success by episode four or episode five or something. That's interesting. I can't think of an example off the top of my head. I have, you know, the, the Arrested Development anecdote of sort of reviving uh, or keeping alive the, the, the mythology of a show or the, the, um, the kind of culture around a show um, is true. And people have used uh, Twitter to try and campaign for it to be uh, reinstated as a show or to have a movie made out of it. Um, I'll have to think about that one some more because I, I can't think of any off the top of my head. I think Firefly. The, okay. The, the oh, yeah, that's, that's, right. that's right. That's right. Had exactly that. that the Twitter campaign and the blogging campaign brought the film out. But right. let's go out to the audience. Anybody have a question for Twitter? Less than 140 characters, if you can manage it. Right here in the front. I'd love to know, um, how is Twitter... Wait, wait, wait. You just wait for the microphone, sir? <coughs> Hi, sorry. Um, I'd love to know how Twitter actually makes money because there isn't a kind of obvious advertising model or, um, you know, that other sites do have. Right. Uh, and obviously, it must be very expensive to run. Um, well, so first of all, our, our main priority is perfecting the user experience um, and making the tool work as well as it can for people to be able to connect with whatever they want to connect with anywhere in the world, um, to make sure that the real-time nature of it's working. That's priority number one. Um, as for the, the advertising, it, we always say that it's, um, we're delighted that people don't notice the advertising. It's actually a testament to how well it's done that it's not intrusive. There actually are three different uh, ad products on the site now that are there, but they're subtle. They're marked as promoted. There's promoted trends, promoted tweets, um, promoted accounts. Um, but they're, we've been extremely careful about making sure that that doesn't get in the way of the user experience. So it's, uh, as, as our CEO, Dick Costello says, it's, we take it as a compliment if people don't notice that. So. Where else are we going to go? All the way on the left-hand side, please. Oh. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering about, uh, we've had people in, in shows that we've made, uh, sort of personalities, famous people that have fake accounts, people who are pretending to be them that aren't. And it's, it's sometimes, because they have quite a lot of followers, been quite damaging at times uh, when they've said stuff about the show and, uh, and whatever else. Obviously, you have a system where I think you verify well-known people. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that can ever be done about people who are pretending to be someone that they're not? Because it seems like there's more of those accounts than the other way. Um, I, I don't know about the, the last piece, that there's more of those accounts than the other way. But um, So we do have a verification process, which is you know, fairly time-intensive because we're really trying to you know, prove um, that someone is who they say they are online, um, which is notoriously difficult from a bunch of different points of view, but we do have a program like that, um, and we do have an anti-impersonation policy. Um, so, so that's something we're, we're continuing to work on, and uh, it's a it's computer science challenge. is also kind of a logic challenge, but it, this, is a, this is a hot topic right now in, in, this, in the world of talking about social networks, is how much verification should be required 
Um, so if you look at uh, pretty much any kind of tech blog, this is, um, this is definitely out there as a conversation. I think everyone really cares about it, and we definitely want to make sure that you can trust um, what it is you're seeing. Um, so it's kind of an ongoing, ongoing thing, but we, we have ways of, of dealing with it, and we'll take down impersonations, and we'll, we'll definitely do verified accounts. It's just going to be um, something that we work on to make it scale is the, is the part that's uh, requiring our focus right now. A point for Twitter whilst I'm waiting for another hand to go up. It's saying um, from, from Carly Brooks, who's in the audience somewhere. Where are you? Um, Hello. Hey, yeah. Um, it says our on screen talent also has to start pulling their weight and maybe they need support and deals from the broadcaster. So you obviously, uh, or maybe not obviously, but on screen talent is going to say, well, if you want me to live tweet during transmission, then you're going to have to give me some extra cash. It's going mm. to have to be my contract and so on. How do you see those sorts of deals? Are you involved in those deals at all? Do you, are you, do you party to any of those negotiations or is it just something that's happening? In no, it's just something that's happening. I mean, the vast majority of uses of Twitter are things that we didn't think of that people came up with. Um, and that they employ in different ways. And um, no, I mean, for us, we just kind of tell whoever is interested to kind of hear the, hear the best practices. We don't get in the way of conversations between talent and producers or broadcasters or anything like that. Um, we're happy to give everybody the information, but that's not our, not our business. Uh, into the, over there in the left of the audience. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you had any insight into what the impact will be of the two-screen experience becoming a shared screen experience mm. through connected TVs and, and, and what that might mean for the way Twitter's used if it's, if it's on a single screen rather than a, a, a secondary and separate screen. That's interesting. Um, I think for a long time people have been talking about it all happening on one screen. Um, the social interaction or sort of secondary activity and viewing. But it hasn't really happened. Um, it, it's, not like, it's not like the technology is not possible. It just hasn't really been the, the culture of it. Maybe it's just because people, the, the pace of kind of cell phone usage um, way outpaces anything like a smart TV or something like that. But um, so it's, it's possible it could happen all in one place. Or people uh, watching, like I think Eric, yesterday Eric Schmidt spoke a lot about uh, social TV at the beginning of his talk. and. He mentioned Twitter a lot, but they also talked about YouTube and uh, Google Hangouts as an example of the shared, shared screen experience. Um, so I really don't know. It's kind of hazardous to predict, but I think uh, it, it will definitely have some interesting applications. Then from a, from a broadcaster or programmer's point of view, though, I don't totally see how a shared screen in terms of multiple faces talking to each other, how do you make that scale in a way that actually works for storytelling purposes. The thing that's nice about just using metadata, little tags, is that it, it doesn't really cost anything and it doesn't need to interfere with the basic story, so. I and, and many people on Twitter were, uh, in the audience were, were very taken by your beautiful infographics. Um, and an awful lot of people in here are lusting after those numbers and would really dearly like to have them and perhaps more than they would like to have the overnights. Um, the, where can they get those figures? Can they come to you with a big check? Or are you hmm. giving them away for free? Or is it third parties or whatever? How can we get those figures? So we're working on some of our own uh, tools to provide to folks. Um, but what's where the growth really is in, in analytics and infographics and that sort of thing is, is with uh, what we call our ecosystem partners. The examples I gave before were like Bluefin and a Trender TV chart. So this market of startups that, are, um, that we work out a uh, relationship with and they get access to our data. Um, it takes quite a lot of technical expertise to be able to uh, actually even just ingest some of that data because of the size of it. And then yet another layer of technical expertise to be able to slice and dice it and analyze it. Um, so it's, there's more and more companies out there doing it. Um, and I think it's going to be really, especially on the infographic side of things, um, uh, and data visualizations, infographics, whatever you want to call it. I think those will actually become, and they're already seeing this some now in, in newspapers and on TV, those are becoming part of the media story too. People are telling stories with the numbers and the kind of issues maps and things like that. And I think that's going to be particularly interesting around, say, the Olympics next year. Um, you see activity around how, who people, what people are talking about what, which are the big unforgettable moments of the Olympics. 
and uh, definitely around the, uh, the elections. In this next, what, 18 months or so, there are huge elections in US, France, Kenya, a number of other places. And I think that these, these will be the infographic elections. Um, and big data will become kind of more accessible for, for uh, voters. But the data you have at the moment is really just, um, just the hashtags or retweets or things like that. You can't at the moment tell anything about who those people are. Are there efforts underway or any thinking underway about saying, not only can, can we say that you had 500 tweets a second on this particular hashtag, but of those 500 tweets a second, 30% of them were living in London, Asia, under 35, or were, you know, whatever. Is there any way of identifying them at a more granular level? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to where, where, we're, where we're going with it, but generally, um, we try and be really clear on Twitter that, um, that whatever you publish on Twitter is public. There's, there aren't different, it's, it's, it's an on-off switch. It's public or it's private. Um, and so if you choose to you know, talk about your location or go out of your way mm -hmm. to you know, let everybody know about who you are, that's going to be accessible. Um, you know, um, we haven't been playing with that kind of in the aggregate, but, um, but uh, that, that's, um, that's how that works. It's, it's, it's all about self-identification. Um, and, and if it's not, then, then it's not available. So. Final thing for me before we go back to the audience, but there, there have been a, a number of startups that, that are trying to measure the, um, the influence of individuals, on, specifically on Twitter, so clout being the, yeah. the most famous one. Um, where do you see that sort of business going, where, where, where there are, as you say, this ecosystem startups using your data and data from Facebook and data from Google Plus and, and, and other social networks to work out who are the, the mavens, who are the thought leaders, who are, who are all those different you know, roles in society. Yeah, uh, I think it's really interesting. I think that we think about that the same way we think about the infographics market. It's very interesting. It clearly provides value to people out there. It's not our core mission. Um, so our core mission is just make the one thing that Twitter does better and better and better. Um, which is just to instantly connect people to what they're looking for. Uh -huh. um, and so that's, we, we, we like it, we watch it, we follow that, that part of, that kind of secondary market with interest. Um, but it's not where our attention's focused. Fantastic. Back out to you guys over there, sorry. Hi, I'm actually asking a question that came through on Twitter into this room, which I find really interesting, <laughs> which is from Mark Sweeney. Um, and he was asking, um, Glenn, if you could comment on David Cameron's um, proposals to close down social networks to avoid um, rioters communicating with each other, should we get into that situation again? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not the right person to, to comment on that. Um, Do you have a view, though? I mean, uh, no, I, I, no, no comment on that. Um, so we have, <laughs> we have a, as you know, we have a, um, a, a growing team here in the UK, and they've, they've commented um, on this, and I'll leave it to them. Um, I mean, Eric Schmitz commented that he thought it wasn't a very good idea that you can't close down social media. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't, can't help. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's a, it's a good for Eric. Um, the, the <laughs> Uh, one, another question that's come up on, on Twitter was about copyright. Hmm. Who owns the copyrights of all of these different things? The copyright of the tweets, the usernames, and so on. You know, I used to be a copyright lawyer, and I'm a little rusty, and I don't know the answer to this one. I, it's, I'm sure it's uh, explained in the terms of service, though. I could look it up right after this, but um, I can check that. But we're not, if, if, somebody was, if a production company, for example, was to uh, create a fictional character on Twitter and start putting... You know, oh, right. content onto it uh, in terms of tweets, do they, do they continue to own that? Or yeah, yeah. I mean, all, the, the content that you create continues to say yours. Um, it's, the way copyright works in general is you don't have to explicitly reserve sure. a copyright. Um, it's just automatically granted to you when you, when you express it. So, yeah, it would, any, any sort of unique character like that would have probably some copyright and trademark protection just by default. So. <laughs> way at the back, in the darkness. Hi there. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what the uptake of Twitter is amongst teens. I've got a 16-year-old and a 12-year-old. They spend all their time on Facebook. And they're a bit nervous of Twitter because you have to attract followers. And 
all the status um, that they have on Facebook, I think, is, is uh, geared up to how many friends they have. Well, that's a really interesting question. So a couple things. We don't break out the, the demographics of the, of the site. Um, um, but the second part is really interesting, that they feel like a pressure to, um, to get followers. And I think that one thing we really want to encourage people to think about Twitter in terms of thinking about it differently is it's not just a place to be followed or to express yourself. Not everybody has that much to say, and that's okay. And we want to encourage people to, um, I mean, not to say publicly, right? I mean, I use Twitter, I by far use Twitter more to consume than to publish. It's, it's, a, it's, it's the best news feed in the world. That's why I originally got hooked on it, why I originally wanted to work there. Um, uh, I don't tweet nearly as much as a lot of people I know. I don't have nearly as many followers as a lot of my colleagues, like many orders of magnitude fewer. Um, but it's, it's, it's not going to change the fact that I'm using it as the best news feed there is. Um, and we, I think we're going to take steps to welcome people into that view of it as well. So thanks for asking that, actually. That's a really important point. Well, on that note, the fact that not many people have that much to say, I think we've pretty much run out of the things to say. Um, we've learned, I think, a lot today about different ways of using Twitter, the, uh, the different ways you can use it to engage audiences and, and to keep them and to maybe even gain audiences. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots more questions for Glenn. He is leaving and will be outside if you can grab him. But if you stay in this room, or at least come back in half an hour, there's another session on Twitter, The Only Way is Twitter, from 2 until 3. I'd like to thank you all very much. And Glenn Brown, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot.